Okay, well, this is the third of our uh, sessions in the uh, LIDAR and Canada Wildfire course. And uh, joining us is uh, Dr. Chen Shang with the Hatfield Group. And um, today, Chen's going to give us a presentation on some of the work uh, he's been developing on uh, forest fuel attribute mapping using the ArvoSense Fuels tool. So Chen has uh, 10 years of experience in the geomatics and remote sensing uh, work environment and uh, has a PhD from Queen's University focusing on remote sensing with specialization in LIDAR and forest attribute mapping. And then a postdoctoral fellowship from University of British Columbia, where he utilized uh, Landsat, as I understand, for uh, vegetation uh, change assessment and large area mapping from, uh, from regions to national scale. And currently is the senior remote sensing scientist with uh, Hatfield. And so this is one of the projects that uh, Chen has recently been uh, a lead developer on, and um, he's going to give us a presentation on how it works and a little bit of a demonstration on the uh, ins and outs of uh, how we might actually use it for fuel mapping. So thanks very much for being with us, Chen, and I'm going to hand it over to you now. Well, thank you, Chris, for that warm introduction, and also thank you for uh, inviting me to uh, giving to give it this uh, presentation and demo of this uh, tool set. Um, so this um, project is actually a uh, team effort uh, between Hatfield and the research group, well, the uh, Dr. Chris Hopkins and Dr. Laura Chesmer's labs uh, from the University of Lethbridge. And um, this was actually uh, with funding support from uh, Innovative Solutions Canada and uh, our intended um, client during, at least during the development phase uh, would be uh, Natural Resources Canada. Um, so just a quick um, overview of what I'm gonna go through today. So first I'm gonna uh, briefly touch upon the, uh, the background of this project. Then I'm gonna go to the objectives for our uh, R&D work, uh, followed by a uh, introduction on the uh, design and implementation of the ArboSense Fuse tool set. And lastly, I'm gonna give a live demo and hopefully we'll leave some time for questions. Um, so since you're all joining this uh, wildlife uh, Wellfire uh, Canada webinar and also the latter course at University of Lethbridge, I'm sure you're all very aware of the importance of monitoring and managing uh, wildfire uh, in Canada, uh, especially given the increased intensity and frequency of wildfires across Canada in the past few years. Um, so in Canada, the system that we use to track uh, or monitor uh, fires is the Canadian Forest Fire Danger Rating System, or CFFDRS. So it has two subcomponents. The first one is the fire weather index system. So this is a component that uh, serves the purpose of um, uh, tracking fire weather. So uh, in particular, the ignition conditions, because you know, you know, if it doesn't ignite, ignite then there will be no fires. And then the second component would be the, uh, the fire behavior prediction or FVP system, uh, which deals with uh, simulating or uh, mo uh, monitoring the, um, the spread of fire. So um, as you can see from this uh, graph on the right hand side, uh, this summarizes the different inputs and outputs um, of the FVP system. Um, so as an input, it has uh, overall uh, five inputs. So it has uh, fuel, and then also weather. So that includes things like wind speed, uh, wind direction, and so on. Then also topography uh, plays a very critical role uh, in determining the spread of fire as well. So we want to, uh, so the topography component is included in there as well, including uh, slope. And also we have foliar moisture content. Uh, so this is uh, basically a function of uh, elevation, latitude, longitude, and uh, what time of year it is, uh, which is uh, quite important in determining the, uh, um, the foliar uh, moisture content. And lastly, there's also a parameter uh, about to control, you know, how much further you want to look in the future to to to, to assess uh, the condition of the fire. So that includes, uh, you know, time since ignition, as well as the time of the uh, as well as the type of input, whether it's a point source ignition or uh, 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 something that's uh, wider. Then in terms of outputs, um, there are a number of um, parameters that are commonly used to to describe or categorize uh, fire events, including uh, rate of speed, uh, rate of spread, uh, fuel consumption, head fire intensity, so on and so forth. And then there's also a list of secondary outputs, uh, which I'm gonna not gonna go into here. 
Uh, but you know what they say about models, you know, garbage in, gar garbage out. Uh, but, you know, by quoting this, I'm not saying that, you know, everything's garbage. Then if that's the case, you know, there's no reason for us to be here to to uh, to see this uh, presentation in the demo. Uh, but what I want do want to emphasize is that, uh, you know, um, the quality of the output from a model is uh, very heavily linked to the, in the quality of the inputs. Uh, so in this regard, um, this project primarily focuses on the, the fuel component. So currently, uh, the data sets that, that's currently uh, being used in the FBP system is a very generic um, fuel map across Canada. So it contains about 16 fuel types. Um, so for example, it covers uh, spruce, lichen, woodland, boreal spruce, so on and so forth. So these are, uh, in, instead of you know being directly indicative of uh, fuel characteristics, these are uh, based on uh, inference. So for example, uh, we know that um, conifer forests are um, more prone to fire than a deciduous forest. And um, so this kind of map is based on this sort of link uh, between vegetation type and fields, uh, but that's not, that is not ideal. Uh, as you can see from this map, uh, this is a very sort of broad map that covers the entire Canada, which may be very good and useful for uh, national level uh, reporting or um, strategic planning, but it does fall short in terms of operational planning and fire mitigations. Uh, so for example, if you were to, to look at this map in more details, so uh, for um, C2, we have uh, boreal spruce that covers lots of areas in BC and also in Ontario. But uh, you know it's hard to believe that these two regions have overall similar fuel characteristics. Um, so for this reason, uh, the FPP system has um, uh, raised the bar in terms of the quality of inputs it's looking for. So specifically, it's looking for um, a set of attributes that are uh, intrin intrinsically linked to fuel char characteristics. So for example, overstory fuels, understory fuels, or ladder fuels, and also ground and surface fuels. So if we can uh, provide FPP with these kind of inputs, uh, especially with um, refined space resolution, then we'll be doing, then we'll be able to help FPP do a much better job at capturing um, fire behaviors across Canada. So uh, basically the goal, I guess, is to be able to enhance the thematic accuracy as well as um, providing the few attribute maps uh, with a much refined resolution than what's currently available. Um, so the, ISS, uh, the ISC's challenge or Innovation Solutions Canada challenge is basically to, uh, to uh, seek uh, solutions from the industry. Um, that can um, help stakeholders and forest managers to quickly and cost effectively produce detailed vegetation field type maps or few attribute maps um, using LIDAR uh, or RPAS collected data. And here I've highlighted LIDAR and ALS, and that's because um, in through the rest of this presentation, I might refer to LIDAR, I might use these two terms interchangeably. interchangeably. And in case you are not too familiar with these terms, uh, AIS is basically airborne laser scanning, which is um, the same thing as airborne LIDAR. Um, so once we get that out of the way, um, the uh, objectives of uh, this project is to develop a prototype software solution to use available and uh, newly collected point cloud data to generate few attribute information as input to the FBP system and for uh, wider wildfire planning and response applications. To be able to achieve this, we have three specific technical goals. Uh, so first, we need to establish workflows for point cloud processing, uh, which is the emphasis uh, when you work with point cloud data. Uh, second, we need to develop statistical field models and apply them to great output field maps. And last but not the least, um, we also need to uh, wrap all of the all of these two components into a software solution uh, with a user-friendly front end 
or a user-friendly interface such that user doesn't really have to deal with a high learning curve uh, when they try to use this kind of uh, software solution to generate few maps. And uh, for this project, we're um, covering two target scenarios. Uh, the first one would be a wildfire response. So that means, you know, we're short on time and we need to generate some um, um, field maps uh, for stakeholders and, and forest managers. So under that circumstance, um, we may not have access to detailed um, plot data. So in that case, we just you know feed LiDAR data into a set of pre-trained field models that we've developed through this project to make predictions and generate uh, field maps for over areas of interest. And in the second scenario, we call it planning. So that's when we might have more time and more data to work with. Uh, so sub specifically, uh, if the user has um, their own plot data uh, that we can use to uh, integrate with LiDAR data and generate some few models specific to the area of interest, then we can use that um, to generate few maps that are probably more indicative of the conditions of that uh, forest um, in question. So here's a, like a brief overview of the existing tools in this space. So in this list, you can see like the first three are um, common software tools um, in the in this market. So for example, last two is wide, uh, widely known um, for point cloud processing, but it does have a commercial license, uh, which is not incompatible, uh, which is uh, somewhat incompatible with IC requirements. And TerraScan is a similar software, which is very successful in the commercial space for um, processing uh, point cloud but it's not very extensible. And ArcGIS, it's a ubiquitous GIS software in the market, uh, but it does have a commercial product. Uh, it does have a commercial license and not everyone has access to ArcGIS. And even in the public sector, so for example, in the, um, uh, the, the some researchers that we work with uh, for this project uh, in the Northern Re uh, Forestry Center of Narcan, um, they didn't really have um, ArcGIS license for everyone in the group. So maybe they have a shared license or two within the group, but that's not ideal. And then also uh, we have Fusion or LDV um, as a public domain um, software, uh, which I started using um, when I was in grad school, um, but it's not very extensible, nor is it specific targeted for uh, uh, field modeling. So with this in mind, um, we thought of using uh, QGIS as a front end. Um, so QGIS um, is a widely adopted GIS software uh, with a very user-friendly interface that's you know akin to ArcGIS. And um, if we that I you know the way we designed it is that you know we thought if we could bake this solution as a part of, as a QGIS plugin then users doesn't really have to deal with a high learning curve when they get, a, when they get their, ha their hands on this kind of software solution. And then that's at the front end uh, where the user interacts with. And in the back end, um, we've used a set of R-based processing workflows, and in particular, the LiDAR package uh, developed by researchers in the Laval University um, to, uh, to process the point cloud data. Um, and uh, th there's a specific um, QGIS plugin that we use to combine these two back and front end components together, which is called Processing R Provider, uh, which is similar to the script tool in ArcGIS. Uh, it basically allows you to um, uh, to utilize um, functions embedded in the scripts, um, but in while interacting with the uh, with a toolbox within the uh, GIS software itself. And here is a list of few attributes that we're targeting in this project. So that includes canopy height, canopy cover, uh, canopy base height, canopy fuel load, uh, canopy bulk density. Uh, well, base oil area is technically not a few attributes, uh, but it's of high interest to uh, to folks interested in uh, forest inventory. We're doing um, forest inventory work. So that's why we decided to keep it in there as well. 
And here is a, uh, a graphical overview of uh, Arbosense fuels. And if you need to leave early, uh, this is what I want you to remember. Uh, so basically, um, Arbosense fuels is designed uh, and implemented to process LiDAR point cloud data uh, to uh, obtain structural metrics, um, as you can see uh, here. And then um, from there, um, we can um, model forest field attributes with or without ground field plot data, and then uh, produce gridded maps of uh, uh, field attributes at various spatial resolutions, uh, as shown here. And then here is a more detailed look at um, at our implementation. Um, so um, here we have two giant boxes: uh, the back end and front end. So if we uh, start with the backend, so that's where um, all the processing and modeling takes place. Uh, so in here, we have a box that says uh, point cloud uh, processing pipeline. So that's you know where the majority of the code is. Uh, so it does a number of things, including um, applying op optimization procedures um, to improve efficiency, efficiency of the workflow, and also assigning a the right projection uh, for the point cloud data, uh, because in many cases, uh, the software, the data vendor is supposed to um, do the pre-processing, including projection of LiDAR point cloud data, but sometimes that projection is inaccurate or it's off. So that's why we decided to implement this module to, uh, to make sure the, um, the data has the right projection uh, going forward. And next up, we have the uh, the ground versus non-ground return classification, uh, followed by height normalization and then a generation of a number of ALS metrics. So uh, with that in place, uh, basically in the backend, we take um, LiDAR and as well as field plot data collected by, uh, by Dr. Hopkins and Dr. Chasmer's group um, uh, in Alberta uh, to train a set of uh, statistical field models. And then um, at the front end, and this is where the, uh, the user uh, interacts with. So depending on uh, whether um, there is plot data available um, for the area of interest, if the answer is no, then it falls in the category of rapid response. So in here, we only take the uh, the LiDAR point cloud as the input from the user, uh, pass it through the point cloud processing pipeline, and then apply these um, pre-trained models um, to the to LiDAR data to uh, to generate a few attribute maps. Um, in contrast, if the plot data is available on top, well, in conjunction with the uh, the LiDAR data, uh, that falls into the category of field planning. So in this case, um, we're uh, using both uh, the user's LiDAR data as well as plot data to train a set of um, uh, field models on the fly uh, after uh, the pre-processing takes place. And then uh, it's gonna, the, the model, uh, these um, ad hoc field models gonna, are gonna be used to generate the field attribute maps uh, over the um, areas of interest. Uh, so in terms of the plot data that we used to build these um, few models, um, the field campaigns were led again uh, by uh, our partners uh, at University of Lethbridge. So specific specifically, we have a few, quite a few field campaigns uh, between 2021, 2022, and 2022. Um, in uh, Jasper National Bank, uh, Jas Jasper National Park, uh, Banff National Park, as well as Waterton, um, those are in total about 40 plots uh, established in these locations. Um, uh, these plots have a 11.3 uh, meter radius, so that's a point. 04 hectare field plots. So within each plots, uh, the DBH height of each tree were measured, and then um, the species were recorded, and also the condition of the trees. So the conditions are referred to the uh, to the mountain pine beetle attack stages. 
So in this uh, region, for example, as you can see from the right-hand figure, uh, in Jasper, we do have uh, lots of areas under the impact of uh, mountain pine beetle attack. Uh, so in this, at this stage, um, the conditions of the attack were also recorded to track how it might uh, influence the field modeling process. And after we've compiled all the data together, or after um, the Lethbridge team have compiled data together, um, the um, uh, species-specific allometric equations were applied to the data set to, um, to derive um, first a background biomass for different components of the forest. So for example, bark, branch, foliage, so on and so forth, and then uh, further converted into um, the field attributes that we care about. For example, canopy field load and uh, canopy bulk density. And here's the LiDAR data that we used uh, to build the, the field models. So specifically, we're using um, the, um, the Titan multispectral LiDAR instrument uh, from Optech. So com compared to the conventional LiDAR system that has only one near infrared channel, it has three channels uh, located in the uh, shortwave infrared, near infrared, as well as green region of the spectrum. And the nominal point density across the different study sets uh, are um, is 5.6 points uh, per square meter. And then uh, all these data sets were organized into two by two kilometer tiles for ease of processing. Um, it's worth noting that um, since the multispectral uh, LiDAR sensor came out, there has been a lot of active research, research on how um, force structure can be better categorized and captured using these um, multispectral instruments. And however, um, when we're doing this project, the intention is to uh, train a set of um, field models that are as widely ap ap applicable as possible uh, to different regions and different areas uh, where there might not be, um, where the, the multispectral layer data might not be available. So that's why we only use the height component uh, to train models and we didn't really use any of the intensity metrics. And here's a look at the, uh, the raw uh, ALS data. Um, so this is actually one of the two kilometer tiles. Um, so if you do the math, um, you know, with a nominal point density of five points uh, per square meter, and this also, you know, two by two kilometers, then overall in this small tile, in this tile, we have about 20 million points. And in here, the, um, the color of the point, the points are color coded um, to represent height. So this is, um, instead of being re representing tree height, it's actually, um, uh, height above mean sea level. So here's a, a, a better look at it so that um, you can um, have a better idea of what it captures. So, so here the elevation values is the elevation of terrain plus the tree height. And um, in order to, to process the point cloud, the first step is to uh, to do the ground return classification. So in this step, the, the objective is to differentiate the ground returns from the non-ground returns. And then in this process, there are lots of um, different algorithms available. And in, in, in this case, we use the cloud simulation function to do the, um, the ground return, um, to do the ground return classification uh, in the, uh, in the Arbosense fuels, uh, fuels tool set. And then with this um, ground returns, uh, we can derive uh, things like digital elevation models, uh, which you know basically uh, captures the, the relief of the terrain, uh, which, is, uh, which in itself is quite useful for forest managers uh, when they um, do planning for, for example, road network development. And then uh, if we subtract the value uh, of elevation from digital elevation model, um, if we subtract the values representing the height uh, or elevation of the terrain from the raw um, lighter point cloud, then we can normalize uh, the, um, the point cloud such that 
the height of the individual points or returns represent um, height of the vegetation structure. Uh, for example, this is um, a representation of the standardized um, or normalized uh, LiDAR point cloud. So this is the canopy height model. And in each cell, um, the value represents the height of the canopy. And then um, here is that demonstration of how um, how the point cloud metrics are derived from ALS. So um, on the left hand side, we have a sort of a graphic for the point cloud. Even though from a you know top down perspective, you only you won't be able to see the sort of the three D structure. But let's now for uh, let's for now pretend that it's the you know the the point cloud. Then. Um, Across the study area, uh, we have a number of field plots um, indicated here. And then uh, we can use the perimeter of these field plots as cookie cutter to cut the point cloud. And as a result, we can get a point cloud like this, um, uh, which you know you can see uh, some trees in there already. Uh, in order to, uh, to extract um, metrics from this point cloud, um, we can first for example, look at the histogram. So, you know, for some of you, maybe this is a, brings a flashback of stats courses that you took before. Uh, but basically from this, uh, we can derive a number of statistical uh, descriptors uh, that can be used to categorize the, um, uh, this height distribution uh, at, the, at the plot locations. Um, for example, um, this is a list of um, height predictors or uh, height metrics that we derive from um, AOS point cloud. Then that includes um, the maximum height, mean height, standard deviation of height, as well as skewness. So that's you know um, a description of how skewed uh, the distrib distribution is towards a specific um, direction. And then also kurtosis that describes um, whether the distribution of height is you know flat or pointed, and then we also have um, some metrics uh, categorizing uh, canopy cover. So for example, percent percentage of returns above mean elevation or percentage of returns above two meters. Uh, in this case, we use the percentage of returns above two meters um, as a surrogate for canopy cover. So that we don't really uh, need to um, to do a model of kind of cover um, in this project, and instead we're just relying on the this metric to um, to convey uh, that component. Uh, next up, we have a set of um, height percentiles, so from fifteen all the way to ninety five percentiles. And last but not least, we have a set of uh, density metrics. So these were originally proposed by uh, Marie Woods, and uh, I believe he is retired now. But uh, you know, he did write quite a few uh, very interesting papers. And uh, while I was in grad school, I did learn a lot from those papers. So good reads. And uh, with these uh, metrics um, calculated at the plot level, then we can combine. The uh, the response variables, you know, which are in this case the uh, the different few attributes, uh, with the uh, the uh, the lidar um, derived uh, point cloud matrix. So now that we've turned the three D point cloud into a tabular format, then we can just pick our favorite statistical or machine learning model uh, to build a regression model, uh, one for each of the response variables, and then. The idea is basically to try to apply that model um, across the entirety of the study area to generate um, few attribute maps. And uh, in the community, in the LiDAR community, at least this is called an area-based approach. And the reason it's called area-based approach is basically to differentiate it from uh, individual tree-based approach where uh, the subjects of the study, where the scale of the study would be at individual tree scale. Mm -hmm. uh, that's basically uh, revolving around segmentation and identification of trees. And then modeling will be happening at the tree scale. 
Um, so in contrast to the individual tree level analysis, this is you know uh, focusing on area, uh, for example, divided by grid cells. So at each grid cells, uh, let's say with a resolution about of 10 meters, then we can derive the same set of metrics, uh, one of, uh, you know for the individual um, cells. Then uh, we can um, just plug these data into the uh, regression model that we built, and then um, generate few attribute maps, wall to wall few attribute maps across the entirety of the study area. And you know, before we jump into the statistical modeling aspect, um, since we only have about forty uh, plot, uh, forty plots to work with for this project, so it's not many. Um, that's not a lot of uh, data points to work with, so we didn't really have the chance to apply uh, more advanced machine learning um, models uh, for this project. So that's why why we. Um, resorted to parametric regression models um, for to, to develop these few models. Uh, but you know speaking of regression models, um, they do not like um, correlated variables. Um, and uh, typically uh, when researchers work uh, work with uh, lidar data um, in the context of area-based approach, uh, they have to basically, uh, derive a correlation matrix and then look at the correlation between the individual um, LiDAR metrics and the response variables, and then try to handpick some, uh, some of the uh, particular variables that are most uh, strongly correlated with the uh, response variables. And in the, in the meantime, trying to avoid picking um, variables that are correlated. So for example, uh, you might have uh, the mean height as well as the median height of the point cloud as your predictor variables, but in most cases, the median and the mean is high, highly correlated. Uh, so you don't want to include both of these into your model. And that works all uh, fine and dandy, uh, but in this context, um, we're trying to automate the, uh, this process so that you know um, the user doesn't really have to, uh, to worry about picking the right variable um, for the modeling process. So we used a clustering-based uh, feature selection. Um, so this clustering procedure operates in a bottom-up fashion. Um, so it starts from the leaf, and then um, the at each step, the most correlated predictors um, indicated by the squared Pearson correlation coefficient are merged at each step until only one cluster remains. Uh, so for example, um, in this case, we have these groupings highlighted at the end. So uh, these groupings highlight um, variables that are highly correlated with one another. So for example, here we have the, these two uh, canopy cover measures. Um, so that's percentage returns above two meters, and then this is um, percentage returns above the mean height. So these two are highly correlated as indicated by this um, clustering-based feature selection. So uh, what we want to do is from each grouping, because within each group, the variables basically can convey the same information. So you only want to select one variable um, from each cluster, um, which will be entered into the, um, into the regression analysis. And uh, here is basically a, um, a summary of the correlation structure after the cluster-based um, feature selection. So here, the uh, the particular variables are highlighted in this region, and as you can see, by comparing the the, the color of this um, heat map with the um, legend, you can find out that uh, in most cases, um, the correlation between these particular variables are pretty low, um, uh, below 0.6 in terms of Pearson correlation coefficient. So uh, from that we can we can say that the uh, the feature selection did a good job in terms of teasing out uh, the highly correlated variables. And next up, um, we did uh, we conducted best subset regression. So here is a basically an illustration of how it works. 
So compared with um, stepwise regression, so you know either uh, backward uh, elimination or forward selection, uh, you know it selects variables uh, following a specific order, um, which may hide some of the important combinations of variables that uh, really does a good job of exp of explaining the variance in the response variable. So that's why in best subset regression it. Um, tries all different combinations uh, of uh, predictor variables. And at each model size, it tries to uh, pick the best model uh, for you to examine uh, based on uh, different criteria. So for example, uh, BIC or mellow CP or adjusted R squares. So, you, so in this case, we're using BIC and the best model reported. And again, because the, the lower the BIC, the better the model is. So the um, the best model here um, is based on these um, three uh, particular variables, and then because um, we weren't we weren't sure um, whether linear the the, the you know the linear transformation or in its original state um, will work the best with regression, so we also tried. Uh, two more um, transformations on the response variables, including log as well as uh, square root transformations. And again, in this, um, in the in our backend, uh, all of these processes are automated. And then, um, in case um, in the selected model, uh, any of the variables have a, still have relatively high um, correlation with one another. Uh, we also set a like a threshold of using var uh, using variable inflation factor of below ten to uh, throughout those models that may be uh, unstable due to uh, our, uh, still relatively high correlation between the predictor variables. And again, uh, because we're only working with about forty data points, so we used a uh, tenfold cross validation. Uh, to get a holistic view of the um, performance of the model. Um, this is um, so that we don't really have to be surprised by a particular, let's say, 30, 70 partition of the data points. And here are some of the models that we built, um, or the, the final models that we used um, for, for the response, uh, for the rapid response scenario. So here we have uh, canopy base height, so it has a uh, R squared 0.67, which is pretty decent. And then also uh, we have model for canopy field load, uh, which has a uh, slightly higher R squared at uh, 0.78. Uh, next up, we have uh, the uh, models for canopy bulk density. Uh, this um, this model has a like slightly lower R squared value at 0.62. And then uh, for basal area, we have the uh, uh, much higher R squared at 0.88. And here is a list of a um, uh, few attribute maps that we've uh, generated for uh, Banff National Park. So we have height, cover, canopy fuel load, canopy base height, canopy bulk density, as well as BA. And uh, uh, we have we also have the uh, interactive map um, on our story map, I think available through here. Can you see it? Yep. Great. So this is our uh, sort of story map uh, maps uh, made for this project, uh, where we have um, these raptor layers hosted so that you can interact with with it. Um, to, to examine how it works in detail. Uh, so here we have, let's see. Right, we have uh, kind of a height loaded. And then, right, and then we can, Visualize, for example, canopy base height. So uh, maybe I'll share the link uh, in the uh, chat later for you to 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 see it for yourself. 
but um, that's the uh, the product or one of the um, major outcomes from this project. Let me switch back. All right. Um, well, we get the, 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 the statistical modeling uh, out of the way. Um, I also want to uh, talk a bit more about the op optimization we did um, in the backend to, um, to improve the processing efficiency. Um, so, uh, you know, when we try to process um, new data set, um, the processing speed is basically a function of a few factors, including point density, um, areas to cover. So basically, you know, the denser the, the, the point clouds or the larger the area, the, the slower it's going to get. And also that um, another factor would be the data processing standard. So for example, if all the data, uh, if all the point clouds are already classified, so then, you know, the, the backend doesn't really have to deal with the, uh, the ground, non-ground uh, return classification. So that's going to speed up things as well. And uh, if you don't do anything, um, LiDAR is going to uh, basically process all your data sequentially. So for example, in this graph, the green tiles represent the ones that are already processed. And then the, the, the blue tile represents um, the tile that's being processed. And then these tiles uh, are, you know, ones that are yet to be processed. So um, I've tried using the sequential processing and it's slow. So we started tinkering with parallel processing. Um, so as the name suggests, basically it follows the strategy of divide and conquer. And um, in particular, when we try to uh, work with point cloud data, uh, we have these two parameters um, that are uh, quite important. The first one is number of workers. Uh, you know, when we when I uh, saw this term, I thought of you know like the minions in the movie Despicable Me. So you know, think of the you know. The computing resources, individual threats, uh, working as you know minions uh, to do the hard work, and then um, the chunk size is basically how how small we want to divide the original tile size to be, uh, so that the workers can can work on them concurrently. So, for example, in this um, graph, we are using uh, chunk size of around uh, twelve hundred meters. Um, so there are uh, also a couple of factors influencing the, um, the optimal chunk size. So that includes uh, point cloud density as well as the processing tasks. So for example, the um, uh, generating um, the generation of LOS mat matrix uh, might have a slightly different optimal chunk size compared to, for example, ground non ground classification uh, or height normalization. Um, so that's uh, that is to say, it's quite hard to determine the optimal chunk size beforehand. So that's why we started doing this um, a benchmark to try to determine the, the optimal chunk size uh, to use for our processing. So, for example, um, in this graph, we're uh, using the medium density uh, liner data set. So here, if we look at the bottom row, right. Um, so when, if the chunk size, if we use two workers or two threads, um, and then with the chunk size of uh, 600 meters, then it takes about um, 35 minutes to finish the task. And then as the chunk size increases, uh, the, uh, the runtime reduces dramatically. But then again, if the chunk size is too large, for example, at 3000 meters, then it becomes slow again. So we have you know, done a number of different experiments to expand on both the number of uh, workers as well as the chunk size to determine the, the optimal um, parameters to use for parallelization. And in this case, uh, I guess, looking by judging by the color, the best combination for medium density would be uh, using six cores uh, or six workers uh, with a chunk size of 1200 meters. And then similarly, we've done this for a high density data set. So that's uh, for this data set, we used a uh, the a data set with a point density of around fifteen points per square meter. So for this one, the the optimal combination is slightly different. Um, so judging by the color again, the optimal combination 
is around um, 600 meters um, with the six cores. So I guess the difference between these two data sets or experiments is that when the point density uh, is much higher, then you need to reduce the, um, the chunk size accordingly to reach optimal performance. So the outcomes of Arbosen's project um, includes you know, the pre-trained field models and also the, soft, the open source software solution that addresses two scenarios, including rapid response as well as field planning. And then um, we also have the uh, few attribute maps uh, generated over uh, Banff National Park as a demonstration of the quality of our outputs. Then we also have this history is free story map that I'm going to share later in the link uh, in the chat. Um, some take home messages um, from this project. So um, the Arbosense fuels prototype um, is based on open, so open source tools, so including QGIS uh, at the front end and R based processing workflows in the back end. So it has a user friendly interface integrated into widely adopted software. And that's going to help uh, users with only limited technical expertise to take advantage of these tools to uh, to generate field maps for uh, fire mitigation and management. Uh, it's able to use existing and newly acquired data and um, with uh, optimized parallel processing for rapid product production of field attribute maps. Uh, for now, it's able to run on standalone high-performance computers, but we do have plans to uh, to move, move the backend on the cloud um, to really take advantage of cloud computing. And here's a list of partners that we want to thank that you know we either work with directly or indirectly, um, you know, very grateful for their support in this project. And then I'm gonna carry on with the uh, the live demo. Uh, Chen, could I uh, jump in for a second? Yeah. Yeah, I really appreciate the comprehensive uh, background overview. I, I just wanted to know if anyone had any questions before you give us the demo on um, on anything related to the project in general. Uh, does anyone here have any? Yeah, okay, so Brandon, we've got one question here for you, if you don't mind uh, spending a couple of minutes. Sure, sure, not a problem. Uh, so given that the outputs, like canopy fuel load, canopy bulk density, are calculated using the allometric equations. And I assume the those are your observed um, when you're doing sort of observed versus predicted. And you're getting, you're still getting some errors in, in terms of that R squared value. Where do you hypothesize the errors are coming from in terms of those lines not matching up? Um, potentially, things you're not characterizing in, in the stand that are leading to differences or actual um, error in the allometric equation? Yeah, um, I guess it's really hard to tell um, whether the error is coming from the, the allometric equations or from the statistical field models. Um, but um, from my own experience, I would say um, there's still a lot of space for improvement um, when we use LiDAR to try to predict for structure and a uh, few uh, characteristics. So I imagine, I imagine with more plot data and uh, we'll be able to build a more robust uh, model that's uh, hopefully more accurate than what it is now. Um, you know, just taking advantage of the the plot data as well as the um uh it how it you know the, the correspondence between the uh, lidar metrics and those plot data and on top of that there's also lots of active research being done um to try to leverage some of the latest machine learning and deep learning models to uh to really uh try to uh, create a, a better a stronger connection between the lidar point cloud and uh, the uh the 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 forest characteristics captured uh, in the in the plot data. So I guess um, I would say for now, I would say you know maybe the majority of the inaccuracies or errors or uncertainties are coming from the modeling stage than the um, 
than the allometric side of things. Um, although um, on the allometric side of things, there are still lots of um, recent or current developments being made. So for example, with terrestrial laser scanning, you can get really, really high uh, fidelity cap, uh, characterization, characterization of the forest structure. So that to some extent, uh, you don't really have to rely on those sort of generic allometric equations. So I believe from these two fronts, you know, they're real, we really look forward to seeing some, you know, uh, major advancements in the next few years. Actually, Chen, do you mind if I add a little bit to that? Um, I think one of the, uh, something to bear in mind, I mean, there's, there's an N of 40 to, to begin with, which isn't a massive number. Um, and it's over uh, multiple forests. They're all primarily large pole, but from Waterstone up to um, Jasper. And there's a uh, variable conditions of health there. So even if the allometric equations were perfect for a healthy large pole, fine there is some inherent variability to be expected given they're not all entirely healthy large poles. So there will be some uncertainties uh, propagated throughout in the modeling. But, uh, but I think it's important to bear in mind that, the, that this project that Chen is, is uh, presenting on is kind of a pilot or a demonstration. So the emphasis is not necessarily on the quality of the models, but on, on the workflow. You know, the models would improve with better data, more data, um, or they need to adapt over different areas. Um, but but I, but what we're seeing here is this kind of like end-to-end -end workflow in a one-stop shop kind of demonstration, how we can do this. So in a different environment with different data, we'd probably get much better data. Um, but given there's a lot of variability here, I don't think we went into this expecting perfect results. <laughs> so, sorry, Chen, I, I just hope I uh, uh, wanted to add a little bit there. Um, yeah, for sure. See, Laura's got a hand up, and I know Celeste had a question too online. So, and Linda too. So, uh, maybe we'll just pause for a couple of minutes to answer these questions, and then move on. I Laura? just kind of jumped. I, I say I can let Celeste or Linda go first because I just kind of jumped in with an instant question. But if they, if either of them want to go first, it's fine. Uh, okay. Well, Linda's had a hand up, so we'll go to Linda first. Yeah. Hi, Chen. Nice to meet you, Linda. Hello. I'm. I'm doing a lot of work with allometric equations and biomass modeling from LIDAR. And I was wondering um, with this plugin, how much control does the end user have about what uh, what kind of model they, they are using or what kind of cross-validation they're using? Because as I understand it now, there are some assumptions being made that are quite generic and it might not apply um, everywhere, <laughs> mm -hmm. obviously. And so I was curious, how flexible is it for the end user? Yeah, for now, uh, you know, for example, with the uh, the rapid response. So you know, because uh, in the resp rapid response stage, uh, we'll be just using the uh, the pre-trained models to do the predictions, and then in that case, it doesn't really have much flexibility in terms of user control of, you know, what models to use and, uh, you know, such. And at the uh, field planning stage, um, there is some flexibility uh, in there as in, you know, we do allow user to, to use their own plot data and then use that to, for model training and then uh, generation of the uh, few metric of uh, the, the few attributes maps um, afterwards. And then as you all see later in the demo, we don't really, you know, we try to um, do as much as we can in terms of accommodating the different formats of the user's plot data and so on. Um, but in terms of the more advanced control of the modeling process and how that add, uh, how the those uh, few models are built, are developed on the fly using the user's data, uh, not too much control for now. For example, how the, the cross validation is done, you know, how many folds it's, you know, the data set is being divided into or which parameter to um to set in the in the um, modeling stage, for example, the variable inflation factor, or whether to use BIC or you know other indicate in, in indicators for the uh, best subset regression. But uh, we do expect in the next phase of the project to accommodate. Uh, more flexibility uh, into the model, and for example, to uh, to allow user to to specify the eco region that they're, they're working in, and maybe we'll have like a meta model uh, that plots plots into different scenarios based on the user's requirements. 
So that's uh, what we're hoping to do in the next stage. Yeah, that's that's good to know because you know it's not just um regression model fits, but also about how are the residuals distributed. And obviously yeah. you know that, but and the end user needs to know what is the spread of the residuals and how does it change based on certain predictors. And that could very much enhance a, a model, even though the very first R squares or BIC uh, might not be that good. So I'm glad to hear that that's maybe improving in the next version and that the end user has a more knowledge about what they're actually doing and how good their models are actually are, also given the data that they have and the area that they are in. Yeah, yeah, for sure. And uh, just to, you know, I, I guess as a clarification, um, that you know, that we are, we are working with a, like a trade off in terms of whether we want to, you know, how user friendly we want to make it, right? The more user friendly, the better control, the, the less control the user will have. So in this case, we're trying to aim for user friendly, and then in the next phase, we're gonna try to um add more knobs to the tool so that users with more technical expertise can tweak it to their desire. Uh, it, it is just time. I'm going to move things on. Um, so we'll move to Celeste quickly, but Olivia, did you have a question or a comment? I just had a quick comment just uh, related to um, the Arbo Sense Fuels uh, project. Um, Chen kind of mentioned it, but it was uh, funded by the ISC challenge. And under that challenge specifically, they were asking for a user-friendly uh, tool where people who aren't trained statistically or with ladder processing were able to run the tool quickly. So we we developed it, um, uh, the ArboSense Fuel tool set to meet that objective. Uh, of course, in the second phase, uh, we can modify that, right? And, and make it uh, more flexible and more interactive. <clears throat> Just wanted to give that context. Yeah, thanks for that clarification. I think that's a very, very important part of the design brief that uh, that, we're, that we're seeing here. So thanks for that. Um, Celeste, do you have a quick question? Because I know Chen would really like to get into the demonstration. So if it's a quick one, we can do it now. If it's more involved, we could do it after the demo. Um, well, I guess I can uh, just grab one real quick one. And it was on slide 24. Um, you had your second um, row of data. You had a Z max of 1240. And I was just wondering what was causing, uh, oh yeah, so slide 24. Uh, yeah. Uh, yep. Yeah, and so I was just wondering what was causing the Z max to be uh, like 1240. Are you working with data that has been filtered for air points and stuff like that? Or are you actually using raw point clouds yet that will still have these kinds of artifacts? Good catch, that's a very good catch. Um, in this part, we did um, use the normalized point cloud, but uh, there were in the original raw um, in the raw point cloud, it was not cleaned perfectly. So there are still some high flying points that are joist noise. Um, but um, but in the later uh, iteration of the software, we added some filters um, into the backend so that it takes a look at the overall topography and get and some estimates of what the elevation should be for the terrain and then automatically filters out some of the high flying noises. But this, you know, this um is this illustration or this table was based on an earlier version of our data set. I'll okay. just jump in there to Celeste. Um, I don't know if you recall, but this time last year we just found out that we got the funding. And basically Hatfield were in a mad rush to get all this data. So I was sat at the back of the room during the LIDAR course, mm -hmm. rapidly processing it all <laughs> and not cleaning it properly. So that wouldn't be the case. Yeah. Uh, and I might add, this was a very good test of a rapid response exercise, right? So you do get data sets that are not in their most perfect and clean condition in a rapid response. Because maybe you haven't gone through days of cleaning and processing and TerraScan. So th this was a good test. And mm -hmm. you know, we, we've, uh, we've seen what that leads to. And Chen has just explained that those things are now getting caught within mm -hmm. the tool. This is, this is interesting. Good. Yeah. Uh, maybe we should let Chen carry on with the demo because that, yeah. that, you know, seeing it in action is going to be uh, perhaps quite enlightening.
So back to you, Chen. All right, thanks, Chris. So this is QGIS. I already loaded the uh, the Bing satellite map so that we know what we're looking at later. Um, so here on the uh, processing toolbox, we have this you know R. Uh, so that's where uh, all our our um, R scripts are. So here we have two tools uh, corresponding to the rapid response and field planning. So let's do this first. Uh, so this rapid response. Uh, so the uh, there are quite a few different um, parameters that need to be selected. So for example, the first one is whether the user wants to use a, a folder of LiDAR data or a single file to process. Maybe um, if you only have like one tile, you would try to use, you would use file. Uh, but in most cases, you want to process a folder full of LiDAR or last files. Then here will be a folder containing this is basically to, to um, let you pick which folder to use. So for example, I'm gonna check this one. And then um, there's also have to spec, we also have to specify um, the folder that uh, we're gonna use to hold all the, to hold all the um, temporary files. So I can create a folder here and use it to hold all the, the intermediate outputs. Then for output cell size, we can leave it for 20 meters. And then the number of threads to use for parallel processing, we're gonna leave it as six. And then here is the uh, the protection that we want to assign to the uh, point cloud in case the other in case the uh, either uh, the data set has the incorrect uh, protection or if it's missing. Then here we can either export it to a uh, to a disk or we can just save it to temporal file. So then I guess we can just run it. So it already recognizes that we're using a uh, folder as input. Then it's gonna do its thing, doing some checks, you know, whether the point cloud is normalized, whether it has the right projection, so on and so forth. And then it confirms that the in this demo in particular, the point cloud is already normalized. So it's just gonna go, in, uh, go straight into uh, the generation of AOS metrics. And then here is the uh, basically the uh, the parallel processing kicking in. So as you can see, it's going through the individual chunks. So they, in total, they have there are like thirty two chunks. And if we look at this folder here, uh, we only have six files. So in this case, this these six files are being divided into uh, thirty two chunks for uh, for parallel processing. Uh, Chen, do you mind telling us what is the spec of the machine that you're working on and what are the file sizes that you're working on? Just trying to get a sense of, you know, the volume of uh, work that is actually happening right now. Yeah, for sure. So the, for these, um, I guess for these six files, uh, they're about uh, 160 megabytes each. So that these are the um, two kilometer tiles uh, with a point density of about... Um, six points per square meter. And let me check the spec for the computer. So it has a memory of 32 gigs and the CPU of, let's see if the processor is listening here. Yeah, and this is the, the processor. So it's one of our um, virtual machines that we use for uh, processing. So quite uh, decent, uh, decently spacked.
Uh, I know it's interesting from our point of view. Some processes are very RAM intensive, or at least if you you know if you can if you have 128 gig of RAM, you can use it if you want to throw big parts of things. Um, but very often it's core or GPU uh, heavy. Um, mm -hmm. Or read write. Some of our processes are incredibly read write intensive. Um, but I'm guessing most of this everything's loaded into RAM, so you're not doing a lot of reading and writing. Well, at you know when the well, at least at the at the beginning when the data is ingested, there's some reading and then at the end there's some writing, but for the most part, it's the, just the processing of the point cloud. And now that's done. So that's about um, three and a half minutes for six tiles. So not too bad. And then we can close this and look at these outputs. So for example, for BA, we can just uh, style it a little bit, give it some color. And set this. So that these are the sort of the six tiles that uh, we used as input. And then we can check off these other layers. Turn it off and compare with the uh, the VHR. So as you can see here, so that's represent has obviously represent the same features on the um from the VHR. So this strip of forest seems taller than their surroundings and it's correct also correctly uh, captured um by uh, by the by the BA layer. Uh, let's take height for example. Turn this on. Then this is the uh this be the the height um over the area of interest. So again, corresponds well with the um with the VHR. So I guess that's a demo of the um of the the response. And then how much time do we have left? About ten minutes, uh, including Q and I. I see uh, Olivia. Do you want sure. to uh, jump in? Yeah, I I just wanted to uh, to give people some uh, uh, comparison. Uh, we did a uh, earlier on in the project kind of comparison of if we didn't do parallel processing, how long it would take um, versus the parallel processing. So Chen, I don't know. Like for example, this process six tiles uh, took about three three minutes uh, and twelve seconds. Can you give the audience a kind of an idea of, of what, if you remember, because I don't remember, <laughs> how, how long it took to process uh, if it wasn't parallel processing? Yeah, so we are, in this case, we're using uh, six cores and uh, it's definitely not six times as fast <laughs> as we would hope to see. Uh, but it's, so it, the speed is more in line with two to three times faster. So. Uh, with six tiles and the original runtime when we use we were using sequential processing is somewhere between eight to ten minutes. So I guess you know if we only have around ten minutes left, we can just go ahead into the Q and A. Okay, thanks for that, Chen. Uh, anyone here have any questions on the uh, operations implementation of the tool? I guess Chen's explained everything very well. Um, Celeste, I think you might have had a couple more uh, questions in the chat. Did you want to um, jump into those? Yes, Zach. Um, well, I, I guess the one, uh, um, another one that I had, it was more probably, I guess, for you and Laura. So we could probably take that one offline. It was on slide 20. And I was just curious about the selection of the field plots and how they um, how they are selected so that they represent a random sample. But I think that's probably a you and Laura question. Uh, yeah, it uh, is. I, and Laura might want to answer go. that if you want. Okay. Can, um, before you do, can I just say that the, the selection of the plots was not intended for the tool, right? That That's something that needs to be borne in mind. The selection of plots was for another question or the study. They're being used here uh, because they're available. So Laura, did you want to add to that? Yeah, um, absolutely. Yeah, this was um, um, kind of opportunistic, but 
uh, really what we what we were interested in is selecting plots across a range of mountain pine beetle disturbances so that we could look at the um, kind of the vertical and horizontal heterogeneity, heterogeneity in the fuel distribution. Um, and that was determined for like RPAS, um, TLS, RPAS, and their airborne LIDAR. And then we were also interested in looking at the change in the fuel strata gap over time, which is basically the, the, the gap between the base of the canopy and the understory ladder fuels and how that varied with um, fire prescriptions. So it was very, it was very targeted for those studies, but not targeted for this. And also bearing in mind that we have to carry a lot of equipment into the field. So we were basically using like what you guys do with the snow, these tools to kind of calibrate the airborne LIDAR data. I, I yeah I think that's that's a that's a good answer. <laughs> Thanks so much. Thanks. Sometimes you just got to build on what you got, right? Yeah. So Linda, yeah. over to you. Um yeah, so Chen, is there also like a layer that you can click turn on to see the the uncertainties of the grid cell on the grid cell level? Uh. At this stage, we don't really have a uncertainty layer for our few models. So I guess uh, what I can show you is here, um, even though we don't really have time to uh, to do the demo for the, the field planning, but I did run it uh, beforehand yesterday and I guess I'll put her here. So let's pretend that we just run the, the field planning tool and this is the uh, sort of the outputs you get. So these are the two files for the output uh, as uh, uh, the few attribute mute maps. And also we get this good as, goodness of fit graph, which basically summarizes the quality of the model. So it has adjusted R squares and also the 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 um the scatter plot bit that indicates sort of the you know um how good the fit is and then from this I guess if we were if we had added the, the name of the plot, you know, we, the user can also have a better idea of, you know, which plots are outliers and whether um, it's a good idea to remove them um, in the next phase of tuning. So I guess we do have this uh, available to us in the tool, but uh, at this stage, it isn't really a spatially explicit layer that um, addresses the uncertainty of the tool or the model. Okay, and do see um do um people have the chance to see what their model actually is, their end model, and what metrics are being used in the model? Uh that's not the metrics in the which metrics are used in the model are not really included um in the interface. Um that's all happening in the back uh, in the background. And um, I guess again, the reason why we did that design choice is so that it, the tool is as um, user friendly as it gets, because you really because from your own background you are you know researcher actually working in this field, so you 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 care about all of that details. But basically, what we're trying to do is we're you know try to uh, take care of all of that as much as possible for a user who doesn't have that level of technical expertise in the area. Uh, yeah. Channel, right? Uh, correct. Just to follow up on Linda's question, because um, from a researcher point of view, obviously that kind of thing is very interesting. Um, but am I correct in understanding that if we were running the same routine in the scripting environment, then those attributes that are in the back end of QJS would now be in the foreground. We'd be able to see them in the log files, right? Is yeah, yeah, for sure, for sure. Yeah, okay. Well, that's, you know, that's, that's all you need, basically. Just a spot for people to find it <laughs> if they're interested in. Yes, that's correct. We were not uh, building stuff out of nothing. It's not magic. So it's, yeah. we, do, we, we yeah. do know which, uh, we, we do know which metrics are used for each model. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, it's, it's super interesting. I, I still uh, would advocate though for the end user to be able to see the uncertainty for the area, because that could actually be important for decision making um, mm -hmm. 
processes if, if you know certain things are being implied although in that area the uncertainty of the success rate of that strategy is really high then you know that could really impact um, the decision making process that is a good point and again in the second phase of the project um, as we are moving forward moving the backend into the cloud um, you know we can probably generating a generate a dashboard that summarizes uncertainty, the the quality of models, as well as maybe generate some layers um, that in, that's indicative of the uh, uncertainties or errors for the area of interest. So that that's a good point. Indeed. Yeah, or or give a warning message maybe also if you know the assumptions are not being met for linear regression. You know, people need to be aware of that their measures of uncertainty or goodness of fit metrics are, might not be what they are because the assumptions are not met, then that could mm -hmm. also be a warning uh, message on the console or yeah, yeah. just something to, to think about. Yeah, yeah, for sure, good point. You know, I, I'm gonna add something again. Um, as academics, of course, we look at things in a certain way and, you know, confidence and, and meeting our uh, hypotheses or our goals are all very, very important uh, metrics of success. Um, but in the real world, <laughs> not that we're not in the real world, but but in the, in, in the world of operations and decision making, especially when it comes to rapid response uh, and, and maybe to a lesser extent you know, on the planning side of things, uh, it, it is often the case that decisions need to be made without supreme confidence. Um, and so that, that's not making excuses for not having high confidence and not being statistically rigorous, of course, but it is it is an acknowledgement that we need to make that as academics, uh, we have to understand a lot of the decisions are made outside of academia where as much as you would want to be highly confident, sometimes you can't be highly confident. I mean, think about politicians and a lot of the decisions that are made at a, at a high level of policy. Uh, it's not always made with supreme confidence. And uh, and I think we have to uh, acknowledge that sometimes you know, if you're fighting a wildfire and you need to know something about the landscape, it's better to know something than to know nothing. And so these tools uh, are important. And even if you don't have high confidence, having the information to support decisions is, is much better than not having it at all. So that is, I think, something that we need to consider um, as these kind of tools are developed, uh, they're not necessarily academic tools, even though they can be used that way. Uh, it's the intention is for operations and to support decision making. So um, anyway, I, I just thought it was important to make that point because we often think about things in a, in a certain way, but different communities have different goals and different decision criteria. Um, we are uh, pretty much at time. Um, I see Brandon has a question, maybe we'll make the, la that the last one for the day. Sounds good, uh, thank you. Uh, is the tool available for use? Um, could we use it or uh, how could we use it? Or, uh, yeah. Good question, I'll, I'll refer that question to Olivier, my boss. <laughs> <laughs> uh, the tool is currently in, in a beta format. So uh, as, as you know, all the points that were made, there are, <clears throat> improvements that can be made. So uh, currently it's not, even though it's you know uh, open source, it's not released, we're not releasing it yet because uh, there can be um, more improvements made and it's currently beta. It's used right now, Laura and, and Chris, Dr. Chris Hopkinson and Dr. Chesmer um, have a copy of it, but we're, we're asking that it be kept uh, internal to the lab essentially. Do you have an estimated uh timeline when it might be? That's a good question. Um, we're, we're basically still waiting for um, the second phase of the project. And uh, that phase of the project is essentially two years, right? So uh, we'll, we'll hopefully have something. Uh, that's kind of a rough ballpark um, time frame. But again, we're currently waiting um, for a response in terms of that phase two. Thank you. But we're all looking forward to it uh, being released and, and available for our use. Um, so with that, I'd really like to thank uh, Chen for your time today. Thank you. And thanks everyone for your attention, both here in the room and, and online. And um, yeah.
Bye for now.